Today, I want to talk about uh, some of our weather. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Mark Twain said, made the comment, everybody talks about the weather, but they never do anything about it. But uh, we've had a quite an interesting summer statewide, and uh, I want to address some of those issues and how those might be affect, uh, what impact those are going to have on our trees uh, going into the late summer and fall and even through the winter. And so to help us kind of prepare for next year. So, uh, and then I'll try to wrap up with just a short um, update on uh, any pests that we need to be looking for uh, and disease issues coming up uh, just in the way of update. So with that, we'll get going here. Uh, some of this I addressed back uh, in December at the uh, annual meeting we had uh, at the end of 2020, but I thought it was very important to kind of hit these real quick uh, again, uh, based on what we've seen this summer, uh, particularly with the uh, early drought that we had. And actually, in many respects, uh, as I commented back in December, that drought was ongoing then, really goes back to last fall of uh, 20. Uh, so we're kind of looking at a similar pattern, not as severe, of course, as what we had in 2012, but uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, dry weather and even the rain that we have received, uh, in my opinion, a lot of that's run off and has been very spotty. So I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, soil water relations relative to flooding and drought, because uh, we've had both extremes. I know in some areas of the state they've had a lot of flooding, other areas we've been very dry. And then look at uh, how that affects soil aeration, tree roots, and how that ultimately is gonna to lead to some uh, chronic problems, I think, uh, particularly in the area of, of uh, root rots and cankers and that sort of thing, which we always have with us, but I think with these extremes now that we're getting in our weather patterns are gonna become more and more pronounced. Um, some of you in certain areas have had some uh, pretty significant gypsy moth defoliation. Uh, and so that's gonna add another factor into the whole mix. So I will focus on some uh, canker causing diseases. I want to talk about phytophthora, uh, root rots, those that are coming into play now, particularly with the uh, flooding areas where we have uh, you know, poor drainage and standing water extended for an extended period of time. And then uh, talk about some of the other secondaries as well that go with that. So as we all know, again, we'd like to have that balance um, in our soil makeup, soil volume. Uh, we like to look at uh, you know, the 45% of course is our soil mineral component, but the two areas that really are important down here are the water and the air. Uh, obviously in a drought, we have an excess of dry air in the soil with very little moisture. During flooding, we have of course just the opposite. So that's really a key when we start looking at, you know, how trees are gonna perform and how they're gonna function. Uh, if either one of those water air components are basically out of balance, that's going to have a, a big effect on how that uh, tree does in the future. Again, just a little bit of review here, but when we get into flooding or chronic flooding, uh, even saturated soils, uh, we have the, the whole issue of anaerobic conditions uh, beginning. And of course, this is uh, basically a condition where there's very little, if any, oxygen in the soil. As a result of that, that's going to begin to allow for the buildup of carbon dioxide, methane, ethanol, hydrogen sulfide gas, what we normally associate with swamps or wetlands. You'll get that kind of rotten egg smell. And then, of course, as a result of those chemicals, they're very uh, lethal and very destructive to our plant roots, particularly, again, the really fine root hairs and, and feeder roots that are the ones really responsible for taking up the bulk of our moisture and nutrients by trees. So again, I know some of this is review for a lot of you, but it really is important when we start thinking about how these trees are gonna respond and how they're gonna come out of these kind of extreme conditions that we're seeing. Uh, it can also have an impact on the pH of the soil. Uh, it may uh, raise the pH on acid soils, lower it on alkaline soils. Uh, so that's a huge factor. Uh, you're gonna see uh, issues with decomposition of organic matter, and of course, all of this adds up to a decrease in nutrient uptake and water uptake if your fine root system has been compromised or damaged, and it's gonna make it much harder for that tree to feed itself and take care of itself. Uh, and of course, you have some species that just will not tolerate this at all. I was at a property this week and uh, people were just getting ready to landscape their, their lawn and they were 
uh, asking, you know, well, what should I plant in my backyard? And of course, we had to look at the, the slope and the drainage and the, you know, were there any low spots, all these kinds of things, because that's, that's going to dictate really what will be grow there and what will be successful. Again, as plants people, on, whether you're managing crops, trees, greenhouse crops, whatever, you want to be in this middle box here. We want to be at field capacity where we have a balance between the uh, air and, and water content, as I mentioned earlier, in the soil. We want that pore space there so that we do have some oxygen there for the critters, for the roots, uh, all the living components of the soil. We may have saturated soils here for a while, uh, depending on the situation, and then that may eventually drain away through gravity. But if it's a clay soil, heavy clay soil, it's going to take a lot longer for that to happen. And of course, after a while, the soil becomes saturated. On the other extreme, of course, we want to avoid being down here past the wilting point. And uh, that's, that's a tough one because unless you can irrigate, uh, we're pretty much um, dependent on Mother Nature to help us with that. And uh, as we mentioned, we've had periods of, well, from about mid-June till about, uh, you know, through May and most of June, as you'll see here in a minute, we've had very dry conditions in certain parts of the state. And that makes it very difficult for uh, trees to do what they need to do. Uh, bulk density, soil texture all plays into this as well. And, you know, you may look at the weather, if you were to go back for look ahead to 10 years from now, look back on this, this summer and say, what are, you, what are you people whining about? You had a, you know, a great summer, you had all this rain, all this moisture. Well, if you really think about it, a lot of that water never, really never soaked in. I can remember going out uh, here in the first part of July, even after we had all that rain right after Father's Day, and you dig down an inch or two and the soil still bone dry. So the intensity of the rainfall, um, the night of the EF3 tornado, I had over an inch of rain in my rain gauge the next morning, but that fell in about 30, 40 minutes. And, you know, you'd never know it really even rained. It was still very dry. So a lot of that water ran off, particularly in areas where the soil is compacted or it's been dry for a long time. It, it, it's almost impervious. Uh, same thing with mulch. If you've got mulch that's been sitting there, a lot of that can be very hydrophobic. And you think the trees got watered, but in reality, they didn't. So this just gives you an idea. Texture is related, of course, to um, bulk density and the relationship there. And you can see that, of course, on sandier soils, uh, your bulk densities uh, are considerably uh, lower. Uh, same way with clays. Where sandy and loamy soils, you can get, high, get away with a little higher bulk densities uh, in terms of compaction. And you can see the relative effects that it has on root growth. So. Uh, if you have compacted soils, even on the surface, you're getting very little water infiltration in. Um, and of course, that's going to make it very difficult for those roots to grow into that soil. I mentioned the aeration thing. We I mean, have to have a balance between oxygen coming into the soil. Of course, uh, roots have to respire, have to have oxygen just like we do. And so if that surface is compacted or if the soils are waterlogged, saturated, you're not going to have much room for oxygen. And of course, that leads to problems. And like we talked about with uh, methane and, and uh, ethylene and all that, and of course, ethylene is a plant hormone that actually helps plant tissues ripen. That's why fruits ripen. But we don't want roots to ripen because when they get into that kind of condition, then they begin to rot and decay. We also have to get rid of that CO2. Just like we give off carbon dioxide, roots give off carbon dioxide as well through respiration. That has to escape from the soil and go up into the atmosphere. Otherwise, that mixes, mixes with water. You form mild carbonic acids in the soil. You also uh, start uh, contributing to the buildup of methane, ethane, ethylene, and some of those uh, chemicals. So what's been going on this summer, at least to date? If you go back and read, the, and I just got this weather report for uh, June, just this last week from the climate office here in Illinois. Uh, the first two thirds of June was extremely dry. Uh, in fact, it was one of the one of the driest the top 10 there on record uh, for Northwest Illinois and Northeast Illinois. Then we got all this rain uh, right after that. Um, I'll show you some maps here in just a second. Uh, heavy rain all the way from St. Louis to Chicago uh, in that last couple of weeks of June. Turned everything around, went from one extreme to the other. Uh, we had a, if you look at the weather records, we had a weather than average. Uh, June for Northwest and Southwestern Illinois, sixth wettest for East Central. So those of you in those parts of the state, you know, know what I'm talking about here. 
Oops. And in some areas like in McLean, Livingston County, which is down the Bloomington area and, and uh, a little bit north and east of there, eight to 10 inches of rain in four days. Uh, and this all you know, was right on par with the 100 year rain events. I know I had right after Father's Day, that entire next two weeks at my house here uh, in the southern DePage County, I had as much, over almost 10 inches of rain. Uh, so we went from one extreme to the other. But like I said, don't be don't be fooled by that. You may think we have plenty of soil moisture, but when you think about how a lot of that rain came down uh, in downpours uh, in very short periods of time or were very spotty, uh, a lot of that rain didn't have a chance to soak in. So if we look at precipitation for May, uh, which is what we had, you can see on the left now, this on the left is what we actually received during the entire month of May. And the bluer areas, of course, are where we had the heavier rain. So you can see over here in in parts of Western Illinois and over around Springfield and so forth, uh, fairly good rain. However, if you compare that to what the norm should be uh, from 1991 to 2020 for that same period of time, this is what they base everything on our norms. You can see that most of the state was uh, in a very dry condition with the exception of that same stretch down through from just south of the Quad Cities over around Macomb and down through Springfield and, and down to Effingham. So the rest of the state was quite dry. In fact, for those of you up along the, the border with Wisconsin uh, and southern Wisconsin, you know that uh, we were in even a moderate drought up there, a good chunk of Cook County as well. So again, even though we got rain, it, when you compare it to what the norm should be, uh, it makes uh, really clears it up for us. And then if you look at June, uh, again, on the left here, we have the first 18 days of June. The redder it is, the less moisture, of course, the drier it is. You can see lots of areas here quite dry. If you look at the amount of precipitation we got, we had quite a band that ran um, through that center of the state. So we did get moisture. But again, if you compare that to the uh, norms, you can see that, again, a big chunk of the northern part of the state and southern part of the state were, were pretty dry compared to that band from, well, Chicago over to about the Quad Cities and then uh, down just north of St. Louis and over towards uh, Evansville. But that was that area was in pretty good shape rainfall wise, but many other parts of the state weren't. So you have to look at how much rain we got, but you also have to look at how's that compared to the norm. And just to show variation amounts, this was uh, north central Illinois. You can see here out along the Illinois River. And in fact, I know. Uh, well, I know one colleague of mine with the DNR was on TV one night here recently uh, because of the Illinois River had, they had a flash flood in there with all the rain they'd received uh, down along the uh, Illinois River. So you can see this area right in here was hit very hard with lots of rain uh, in a very short period of time. In fact, I see almost six inches of rain there in just a, a few hours. And you kind of use a gauge. If you're familiar with weather and meteorology, you know that if you get an inch of rain per hour, that is that's flash flood potential because that's extremely high rate of, of precipitation in a very short period of time. And you can see a lot of these areas uh, got very extensive amounts of rain and led to flooding. So just on to give you a little information on the EF3, if you're familiar with that, um, I've lived in this area for over 30 years and this is the first time I've ever dealt with this, uh, any kind of tornado, let alone an EF3. So it was quite a quite a learning experience. And uh, fortunately there were no fatalities. I, when I look at the damage to homes and trees, it's just a wonder there wasn't, there weren't some fatalities, but fortunately there were none. A lot of structural damage, a lot of tree damage. Uh, just a few facts on this. Uh, it started in the kind of the border there uh, between Aurora and Naperville. Uh, they estimated it was about 600 yards wide, which is about a third of a mile and 16 miles long. So it basically ran from the western edge of Naperville clear through to over into Willow Springs, um, just uh, south of uh, Joliet Road down there, if you know where that is. Um, and peak winds of 140 miles an hour. Now, I have a colleague that used to live in Florida and we were talking about that this week. And he said, well, yeah, that's probably about a cat four on the hurricane scale. Now, having experienced 140 mile an hour winds looking out my bedroom window at 10 after 11 at night on Father's Day, I can't even imagine what a hurricane would be like to go through for hours at that, those kinds of wind speeds. Uh, so it's, it's really pretty remarkable. 
Uh, this tornado had all the characteristics of most tornadoes, at least everything I'd ever read and heard that it, you know, uh, it can be very, as my wife put it, very selective in terms of what it damages and what it doesn't damage. And that was just shown time and again, uh, and, uh, you know, the, how the trees were affected as well as structures. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures. I could, we could spend all day looking at pictures and you guys would be going crazy, but uh, I will show you just a few to give you an idea of what we're talking about. If you've not seen the aftermath of a tornado, no surprises here. Lindens, calorie pear, honey locust did surprise me a little bit. Uh, the silver maples and green ash, these are all pretty much heavily damaged. Um, in fact, we could walk down the streets and, and pretty much pick those out pretty quickly. Uh, not surprising, the oaks held up quite well uh, in most cases, which that's what a lot of your storm people use as an estimate of the power of the tornado. If the oak trees are not damaged very much, then uh, you know that's always a good indicator. But these are ones that really took a beating. But I was a little surprised with the honey locust. I thought they would uh, hold up a little bit better. Larger trees, of course, if they had included bark, codominant stems were much more prone to failure. Uh, again, that's not a big surprise. Those are, we know those are points of weakness. Um, private trees, uh, as you go through the area, as we went through the area, uh, private trees seem to be damaged much more than parkway trees. Uh, not sure why, it could be they had, they were taller. It did seem like the taller trees took more of the brunt uh, in terms of damage as it compared to shorter trees and smaller trees. Saw quite a few root plates, failures and trunk failures as well. Some trees were just snapped right off at the ground and literally sucked right out of the ground. You'd go and look at the where the tree was and all there was was a hole there, literally. Um, trees completely gone. There will be a lot of restoration pruning needing to go on for a number of years uh, if the trees are, are chosen to be saved and of course there'll have to be a lot of replanting. So if your community has not gone through one of these or you're in a condition, uh, position where you're in charge of this, these are some of the kinds of things you might have to be uh, you know, have to be continued with. Um, these were a couple of honey locust trees. You can see they're just mangled, just ripped apart. Uh, what Jake would call a hat rack on the one on the right there. But then you can walk 50 feet over and a tree is perfectly fine. Uh, uh, you know, not bothered at all. Uh, these pictures were taken uh, the next day, uh, day or two after the storm went through. Uh, these are some oaks just up half a block up, up my house from my house in a park. Uh, several of them along here. This is a pin oak, another pin oak back there. Honey locust gone. Uh, you know, a lot of damage back here. And the, the pictures I'll be showing you are in this park in our neighborhood. And uh, to the right of this is where you'll see some of these uh, following pictures that were taken. But this is just, just a few examples of what we ran into. Uh, here's your included bark. Again, you can see that, that darkened area there. This is where the uh, conifer uh, spruce split out. We did have wind throw in areas, uh, entire uh, uproot failures. And then of course, a lot of these conifers uh, either were snapped off at the base or you go up 15, 20 feet and it looks like somebody just went through and snapped them off like you'd uh, break celery stalks. So, you know, uh, different trees responded differently to the storm. This is uh, your multi-stems. This is a uh, linden, both of these were lindens. Uh, this was in that same park I mentioned. I can see this tree right here where my cursor is. It just kind of ripped, shredded it, went right up through. There's a narrow parkway up through here. It's a, a walking sidewalk and, and park area right up through here and heading due east. It, it followed that area right up through there, but really did a number on that honey locust. And of course, it just literally destroyed these lindens. And these are 15, 20, 24 inch lindens. They're big trees. And they're a long time, same way here, you can see where they just failed right there at that junction. So just a few examples, this was a, about a 30 inch bur oak uh, tree at the corner of, if you're familiar with Naperville at Bailey and uh, Naper Boulevard, this is fire station number two right here. Uh, this tree was out on the corner. Fortunately, when it fell, uh, it went into the property as opposed to going out on the street, but you can see two bur oaks right behind it, perfectly fine, similar probably grew, started at the same time their lives, but this one was rot, rotten at the base and snapped off at about four or five feet up. Uh, this was a white pine that you can see, it just literally snapped it off. This one up on the, on the roof of the fire station did a little bit of damage, but you can see where it just it really just snapped it off about, a, I'd say it was about a 20 to 24 inch white pine. So 
again, just uh, some trees failed, others didn't. Of course, this is an obvious one here with all the, the rod at the base. So all that said, we're gonna talk about now how all these factors are gonna start predisposing trees to various problems. These are things you're gonna to need to be uh, looking for as we go forward into the growing season. Uh, some of these may not show up for several years. We may forget all about this goofy summer we've had of 2021, uh, but if you get to looking at it and thinking back on it, yeah, all of these factors will be involved in that. So I wanna talk about uh, some of the cankers. We're gonna see, I'm confident we'll see quite a few cankers develop uh, for various reasons. Uh, you know, damage from storms, flooding, uh, the drought, uh, and these are things that are gonna start popping up if they haven't already. So I wanna talk about Phytophthora. This is definitely a, and Dr. Gary Watson and I've had, we've had several discussions on this, looking at things. Uh, this is one that we're gonna probably see quite a bit, particularly in areas where you've had a lot of flooding or your soils have been state saturated um, because this is a water mold fungus. It likes to live in uh, wet, uh, soil, uh, wet soil conditions. It's a soil borne pathogen. Uh, the uh, potato leaf blight that you know killed all the potato plants that led to the Irish potato famine, sod, sudden oak death. Uh, and of course, Phytophthora includes a, a huge group of, of species of fungus, fungi, these all lead to these root rots, crown rots, uh, bleeding cankers like we see with sod and so forth. So most of our common landscape and uh, shade trees are gonna be affected, particularly the maples. Some of the oaks will also fall into that category. Uh, and uh, they're gonna enter through wounds, the spores will enter through wounds or small roots uh, and then begin attacking the tree at the base, usually and working its way up into the uh, crown and root collar area of the tree over time. And symptoms you're going to see are going to be the dieback and decline from the top. Now that doesn't always mean every time you see that, that that's Phytophthora, but that's that's the effect it's going to have because again, it's, it's killed or damaged these fine roots that are going to supply the food and moisture to the tree. This assures, you know, uh, anything else uh, would contribute to that. So that's why these cankers and these root rots, uh, they'll mimic drought, they'll make it mimic flooding damage because the tree is struggling uh, with the same issues regardless of what's attacking it. Six to eight hours of saturated soil conditions can help uh, spread these root rots because again they're, they move with water. So if you've had areas where there's fast flowing streams, lots of flooding, current, any spores there are going to get moved. You do not have to have a wound for infection with this organism. It can actually uh, begin infecting and uh, penetrating young roots and other parts of the tree. If you're looking at the base of trees or plants, uh, you're gonna see the roots are gonna be turning brown to reddish brown. They're gonna be water soaked, uh, typical root rot symptoms. Uh, and it will move then from the outer roots in and work its way into the root crown inner bark and cambium. You can see that on this tree here where it's starting to come up into the trunk area of the tree. Again, it's gonna be a function of areas where the trees are uh, sitting in soils that are very slow to drain or stay chronically wet. Um, also trees that are stressed due to oxygen, reduced oxygen. Uh, research has shown they tend to exude more amino acids and other chemicals, and these uh, tend to attract these zoospores. These zoospores are the ones that move with water and, um, you know, cause infection. And so this is an example here, again, where the tree is changing physiologically uh, because of the stress. And then, of course, that provides the fungus or in, we see it with insects as well, or two-line chestnut borer, uh, or malaria root rot. These are uh, opportunities in it for these insects and pathogens to invade the plant. So symptoms, you're gonna see the bleeding cankers, water-soaked tissues. As I mentioned, you'll see decline and die back. Um, if you dig around, you'll see a lot of the fine roots have died. Now that can also be caused by drought as well. A drought can have the same effect on fine roots. We saw that back in 2012. And of course, eventually then the tree will die. Now that may take years for the tree to die, but this is, begins the process. And of course, the more extreme the stressors are, then potentially the faster uh, that will occur. So obviously root, uh, water management, water drainage is extremely important. Uh, that's why in, in some cases we can't control the, 
you know, how much water a tree gets, obviously, but if they're sitting next to a irrigation head or they're in a low lying area where all the water drains every time it rains, then yeah, those are gonna be prime locations for Phytophthora. So we, again, we need to be thinking ahead of time and thinking, okay, no, I'm not gonna put that Colorado blue spruce or that sugar maple or, uh, you know, another tree that won't tolerate uh, wet soils. I'm going to be thinking if I have to plant a tree there, let's think about a swamp white oak or a bald cypress or a bottomland species that can can tolerate slower, more slowly drained soils and still be able to, to, to thrive. Uh, you can raise the planting site to a point, but I'm not talking about leaving half the root ball out of the ground either. And I've seen that and that's sort of on the extreme side. Watch your irrigation. Uh, you know, we tend to think, well, if the tree is growing right next to an irrigation head, it's getting water. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's getting too much because, uh, as we know, the irrigation is not designed for woody plants. It's for turf. Watch your soil. Um, and, of course, again, think about what plants would grow best there. Or maybe we don't put anything there. Even maybe our best water tolerant plants can't survive in that kind of environment. Another one's hypoxylin. I talked about this uh, in the past as well. A wide variety of hosts. Uh, this one takes a while to get going. It says it requires three growing seasons. It's initially going to start as cankers uh, on branches. You may get some trunk breakage due to the girdling that the fungus is going to kill the vascular tissue around on that trunk or branch and cause it to fail. Uh, you'll see yellowish, orangish, and orange brown coloration where the cankers are going to start. And as they progress, you'll see more of this white, chalky uh, appearance uh, to the bark. Uh, so I've seen a lot of that this last few years, particularly in areas where you have a lot of parks where you've got uh, soil compaction, a lot of heavy pedestrian traffic, uh, things like that, where the, the trees are suffering from drought stress or their aeration issues because the soil is so compacted. Uh, the spring and summer of second year, you're going to start seeing the bark flaking off, which like you see here, these are spore pads, if you will. Uh, they kind of call them, it looks like a blister, but this is where the bark begins to peel off, slough off. And underneath that, of course, is where the canker has been infecting uh, the tissue and killing that tissue, uh, whether it's a limb or a trunk. Uh, usually goes in through wounds or dying twigs. So again, if you've been in an area where you've had hail, uh, where we... Again, we had the tornado. We saw quite a few trees that had damage to the trunk, uh, particularly on smaller trees where there was debris moving through the air, hitting the trunk, knocking the bark off, things like that. Now, for those of you in the three counties of East Central Illinois, Champaign and uh, that area, uh, you may see some uh, flagging here in the next few weeks from periodical cicadas that emerged this last spring. Uh, that's not the same thing as hypoxylin canker, but you may see some flagging or uh, some of the smaller twigs and branches breaking off because that's from where the adult cicadas lay their eggs uh, in that twig or branch. Uh, but that's a completely different thing altogether. Uh, you may see round-headed boars, they can get into that, and some woodpecker damage. Those are all infection ports, as we call them. These are ways in which the uh, spores can invade the plant. But the periodal cicada is just kind of some natural pruning that goes on. Now, for those of you up in our Chicago airland area that feel like you've got left out this year, don't worry about it. We're going to get our big time in 2024 when we have the next emergence of the 17-year uh, cicada. So uh, that's something we can all look forward to, I guess. Um, it's going to take several years for the cankers to really start showing up. Even though they're there and doing their damage, it's going to take a few years for that to happen. Um, and uh, again, the fungi have to live off of something. So they'll produce toxins and other chemicals that help digest their, the food they're on, which in that case, if it's a tree, it's going to cause kill tissue and, and cause problems there. And you may see differences in pathogens, even on the same tree based on their virulence. Because it's they, just like these, the viruses that we're dealing with now, these variants that we're hearing about with COVID, the same thing applies to fungi. They mutate, they change and uh, they can change in their virulence. Uh, one of the more common hypoxylins is the one we find on oaks, particularly red oaks, more than whites. Um, again, this has been very commonly seen in areas of the Ozarks, uh, where you have the more coarse, gravelly soils. Uh, their trees are much more predisposed to drought. That's a little different than what we have in Illinois. We have more of the loam soils and the silty loam soils compared to the Ozark areas. 
but again, they can succumb to this. And an interesting thing, they did find that trees, at least in Arkansas, that were infected with oak wilt, um, actually, uh, this canker actually helped in kind of helping control oak wilt because it was in there competing with the oak wilt fungus for resources. And so it tended to starve out the oak wilt. So I guess there's just no simple, easy life out there. If you're an oak wilt fungus, you still got to fight stuff. But that was something they discovered, at least in Arkansas. Not suggesting as a, a biological control agent for us, but in that case, it did seem to work for them. Uh, you're going to get the initial common wilting, uh, yellowing of leaves. You're going to see curdling of branches. And then, of course, it may eventually move up into the above ground parts of the woody roots. And again, as it progresses, then you're going to see these blackened areas, very definitive margins where the cankers have formed. Um, again, a lot of these fungi are moved by raindrop splash and wind. Uh, so, and insects in some cases, if they land on there, they can pick up the spores and move them around. Uh, the other major group of cankers that I want to hit on here are the uh, thyronectria and nectaria cankers. Again, we've seen a lot of this on honey locusts, particularly the nectaria cankers, the very common reddish orange uh, pustules that form in the cankered areas. Um, and easily seen on the dark gray bark of honey locust. And then others will form what we call a perennial canker or target canker, where you see years of, of effort by the tree to callus over uh, and try to, uh, you know, get the edge on the canker itself. That's usually done during the growing season. And then the canker will come back in and start its thing uh, during the off season, so to speak. And so it's kind of a battle back and forth. But if you look at some of your trees, particularly in the woods, you'll see this, what we call a target canker, but that's usually related to these, uh, thyronectria and nectaria. Um, a pretty wide variety of hosts for nectaria. Thyronectria's got a little uh, more narrow host range, but again, there's the fruiting body that you'll see on a honey locust or a maple or whatever. And of course, these areas are usually sunken, uh, so on made or maybe sap exuding, uh, you know, you can tell there's been a, uh, something going on there because of the tissue that's been killed. Botrysphaeria, this one's not as really particularly lethal to the tree, but it will kill branches uh, and small twigs. Again, oaks are uh, prime candidates here. And this is one, again, you're gonna have to watch this fall because uh, you may go out and think it is Botrysphaeria and it very well could be just cicada damage if you were in those areas where you had the uh, emergence. So I wanted to point that out because this is a very common thing you'll see particularly on a lot of the trees up in the canopies where they've laid their eggs. Um, it's fairly random. Again, it usually only results in the branch tips, so it's not lethal like you would see with uh, some of the other cankers. But wet springs, of course, really promote that. Now, uh, that was one benefit of the drought, I guess you could say, uh, back in May and June, was that we didn't have as conducive a weather for things like anthracnose and apple scab. Now, we've had some of it, but nothing like we normally have because of the uh, weather patterns we had earlier in the summer. Uh, you're gonna get brown wilted leaves. You will see the uh, lesions or cankers along the branch. That's different than what you'll see with cicada damage. Uh, and then within those cankers, you'll see these little black fruiting bodies uh, that look like pepper. Uh, and that's uh, of course indicative of a fungus or a living organism. It's not gonna be something that the cicada is gonna create. Um, again, as I've said, it's all about prevention on these things. Once you get a canker going, it's very hard to, well, you can't get rid of it. All you can do is help the plant, uh, try to keep it at bay. Uh, you can see with nectar, it only takes a week, it takes several months on thyroid nectar once the uh, tissue has been wounded. But there really are no reliable treatments for cankers. There's been some work done on cytospora canker, but, um, you know, nothing really that's going to save you in that respect. It's uh, really that reliable. Uh, Amalaria, this is another very common one. This is a stress-related root rot. Um, again, uh, common on oaks. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen these at one time or another, the shoestring fungus. That's where it gets its name, these black rhizomorphs, usually at the base of the tree, uh, very common uh, on oaks. And again, it's a, it's a secondary, it comes in on uh, oaks that are stressed from whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, I'm going to buzz through this real quick because I'm running a little short on time here. We've talked about oak wilk in the past. 
Uh, this, if you want to be certain of it, you usually have to have this cultured. Root grafts are the most common way that's spread, the most effective way. It's very similar to DED in terms of how it affects the tree. And again, your red oaks are more susceptible than your whites. And the other things you want to look for, of course, is that the fact that the um, red oaks will tend to shed their leaves if they're affected by oak wilt versus white oaks, they tend to hang on to theirs. And red oaks will usually succumb much more quickly than the white oaks, but they both are susceptible. Along with that, of course, we have our two line chestnut borer. You've heard me talk about that before. This is one that usually starts in the top of the tree, works its way down. And then Amalaria, of course, infects the base of the tree. And so the two kind of meet in the middle and by then the, the tree is usually pretty well compromised. All right, a couple others that we, I've seen just starting to show up now because we've had rain and some of the cooler temperatures. This is Rhizosphera. Pretty easy to identify. You've got the purplish red needles uh, just back from the growing tip. I was looking at some uh, uh, spruce the other day that had that. Uh, I'm getting some reports now from Western Illinois where they're seeing it, and particularly in uh, windbreaks and dense plantings where the trees are jammed together, have grown, <coughs> or excuse me, have grown together, and there's very little air circulation. So high, high humidity, uh, you know, lots of uh, humidity, which we have now, with the, except the temperatures are a little bit too warm. Now, if we get into a cooler spell here towards the end of the summer, then we may see it come back, but I'm seeing some of that. Uh, this is typical symptoms to die back at the base of the tree works or the bottom of the tree works its way up. Uh, so I'm sure you've all seen these. Um, Cytosphera is another one, of course, very common on Colorado blue spruce. Uh, similar type thing where you'll see lower branches dying, but you want to look for those cankers, bleeding cankers on the undersides of the branches. Okay, so you'll see the sap there, maybe exuding sap or it may be kind of, uh, crystallized and turned white but that's what you want to look for for a cytospora. Uh, you're not going to see that on a rhizosphera. You're not going to see cankers. This is a needle cast disease. This is where the needles do actually drop off, uh, shed the needles. This is a canker that will kill the branch. And then the other one that goes along with this, and I've talked about this one before, is Phomopsis, very similar to cytospora, except the canker will not be visible. The canker is internal, and if you peel that, and bark back with your knife, you'll see it. If you see a discolored area there under the bark, then that is your uh, phomopsis. Uh, the canker will not be visible or resin will not be uh, usually visible from the outside. You have to peel that bark back on that twig or branch, much like we see with, of course, with thousand cankers disease. The canker doesn't come to the surface. You have to go hunting for it. But other than that, the symptoms are very similar between the two. Again, there's really no effective chemical management for these. Sanitation is very important, getting affected branches and trees out. They have, there are trying, we are looking at some products for rhizosphera, uh, both soil drenches and injections. And so we'll hopefully have some results on that uh, here in the next uh, year or so. But we, we put on some trials for that. Really nothing effective for a cytospora. So those are the things that I, I think we'll start seeing pretty regularly now if we haven't already seen them going into the fall or even next year, of course, the, the needle cast diseases and, and some of your foliar diseases will be weather dependent on what kind of spring we have, but the cankers and some of those things I think are gonna, are gonna become more prevalent probably uh, due to our, our weird weather that we've had. Just wanna touch, touch on a couple of critters to be on the lookout for. Um, I'm sure you all heard a lot about spotted lanternfly. Just want to mention this one. If you've got tree of heaven uh, on your property or your managing property for tree of heaven is there, keep an eye out for the adult. We should start seeing the adults here probably about the first part of August. They're going to be feeding almost exclusively on tree of heaven. Uh, there's some connection there between the host and the uh, reproduction of the adult spotted lanternfly. So we don't totally understand that relationship, but just know that uh, the nymphs will feed on a lot of plants, but the adults like to go to tree of heaven. And so if you've got uh, those kinds of trees nearby, keep an eye on them, monitor them. You're gonna see sap flowing down the trunk from feeding. And then later this season, <clears throat> we'll see the egg masses laid uh, and they're gonna look, it's gonna look like mud. That's the way people uh, described it, uh, like, a, you know, a piece of mud stuck to the side of the trunk. 
and those eggs will stay, stay there then um, until next spring when they hatch. And so this is kind of, you've heard me say this, this is kind of the gypsy moth 2.0 because this, these egg masses can be laid anywhere, just like with gypsy moth. So then uh, those items get moved around, get shipped to one part of the country or not, and that's how it gets spread. Um, they found the initial find in Pennsylvania where it started, they think it came from in, with landscape materials, landscape blocks. So anything, boat trailers, play sets, you name it. They'll just lay these eggs wherever and uh, then they get transported. So I've kind of gone through the life cycle. We're into the latter part of the nymphs now. Uh, they're very colorful, very distinctive. And then they're gonna transform into this, of course, uh, plant hopper. Um, and uh, then the adult will begin feeding on the tree of heaven and laying eggs. So this is the one we wanna start keeping an eye out for here going into the fall. Just want to mention these guys, ambrosia bark beetles. We always have those. Uh, these are all uh, stress-related critters. Uh, so if you've got plants that are under stress uh, in landscapes or wherever, uh, these guys might show up. They're kind of known as shot hole borers because the exit holes are very tiny. And by tiny, I'm talking about a 32nd of an inch in diameter. Uh, bark beetles will be up around a 16th. Uh, and so you can use the size of the hole, of course, the pattern, the number of holes on the trunk of a tree to indicate whether it's a shot hole or a, a bark beetle. But these again are all stress related and in many cases carry various fungi uh, that uh, canker causing fungi as we've talked about here. Asian longhorn beetle, a little update on that if you're not aware, it was found in Charleston last year, uh, Charleston, South Carolina area, not Charleston, Charleston, Illinois, so you guys down there can relax. Um, but uh, this was found in a riparian area primarily hitting red maples. We still have an active infestation in southwestern Ohio. So I'm just saying, be vigilant, uh, keep an eye out for it. Uh, key thing is a half inch diameter exit hole. Um, maples, of course, are at the top of the list in terms of preference. Uh, and uh, it's a very, of course, large uh, black beetle with white markings. For those of you that were here in the late 90s when it first showed up in the Ravenswood area, uh, you know what you're looking for, but just keep an eye out for it. Uh, if you see it, be sure to report it because that'll be very important going forward. But this perfectly round uh, one half inch diameter exit hole is, is classic. Here's your life cycle where, of course, we've got adults out now. They're going to be laying eggs. Uh, those eggs then will hatch. Larvae will go in. And depending on how early they go in in the season, it may take them two years, kind of like what we saw with the AB. Uh, to complete their life cycle, but they're going to be under the bark inside the tree the bulk of the time. And that's where they do their damage, of course, not only to the vascular area, but they also affect the uh, heartwood and go, and go into the heartwood and affect the tree structure. Okay, <clears throat> just another one I wanted to point out. This one just kind of came up this spring. There's a leaf spot that's showing up on some of the Japanese tree lilacs. I saw, I've seen quite a few of those now in the parkways. Uh, through my storm damage assessment work, we're, we're seeing quite a few of those. Not, you know, not lethal, but this is another example of a leaf spot, foliar leaf disease that can impact uh, the health of the tree. This is one that is showing up, so just, you know, keep an eye out for it. Uh, again, it's a typical high humidity, moderate temperature fungus, just like we see with apple scab, anthracnose. Uh, symptoms show up about seven, day, uh, seven days after infection but it can hang around for a number of years in plant debris. So if you can clean up around the trees uh, as best you can, and uh, there are fungicide treatments that can be applied, but again, like any of the foliar diseases, you're gonna have to be uh, committed to that because you're gonna have to be spraying about every 14 days, particularly during the cool, wet periods of, of spring. Um, okay, not so much up here. Well, I am getting questions from people up here as well, but more, Central Southern Illinois. Okay, do I need to keep treating my ash tree? I don't have time to go into all of the details here, but this is kind of the thing, is kinds of questions you need to ask yourself. You know, uh, if you're managing public trees, that's one thing. If you're doing private, think about, okay, how many other ash trees are around? I was talking with a, a couple this last weekend up in uh, Beloit, Wisconsin at a meeting, and they were commenting that they've got a, several ash trees in their yard. They're looking great. 
you know, all the ash trees around there, their neighbors that didn't treat, they're gone. And they asked me, should I keep treating them? I said, think about the beetle pressure in your area. What is there a food source? Uh, the, the beetle is still out there, uh, but you know, it's probably at such low levels in most areas now that it's not gonna be uh, that lethal. Now, whether that will continue or not, that's the next big question. Look at your tree, how good a shape is it in? Uh, what are other communities doing in your area? Are they still treating or are, you, are they backing off on that? Uh, you still have options for insecticides. And I know in some communities now where we've seen where the population's crashed, we are uh, seeing those trees, some of those trees being taken off treatment. Maybe you skip that annual treatment for a year, or maybe you uh, skip a, a triage treatment every third year or so forth and see how the trees respond. You can always go back uh, and uh, you know add a treatment if you have to, but that's that's kind of where we are right now with uh, Emerald Ash Borer. Just gonna wrap with this. <coughs> um, University of Illinois Plant Clinic has a really good uh, handout on oak problems. You can, should be able to get access to it here at this web uh, email address here. Just contact the you know, U of I Plant Clinic. And then the Forest Service also has a nice booklet out on the various common diseases of oaks. So it's a quick guide. It's something you can look at very quickly and get the information you need. So a lot of the information I uh, used in this presentation, of course, came from these reports. And of course, there's always uh, Sinclair's book, uh, Diseases of Woody Plants, uh, the Cornell series that you can use as well if you need, but they're a little, <laughs> a little heavy to carry around in your back pocket. So, but those are available.